That's what I'm expecting. It's, it's funny if I could tell you a little story real quick. So my wife loves me dearly. Thank God she loves me. Thank God she loves me. But I get home today and I've been hobbling around for about a month now. And I look and there's a cane sitting right next to where I sit. And I look at her and I'm like, hmm, how am I going to handle this? And she's like, I got you a cane. And like, she means well, but then it's not so much her, it's my son. I love my son. He's just like me. He comes in from, from football and, and this, that, and the other, and he looks at the cane and he's like, <laughs> and I'm just like, shut up, kid. Just shut up, man. He goes, man, you are getting old. That's great. You can go hungry tonight. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 12. I've been waiting to preach this sermon for some time now. I'm, I'm ex you ever get uh, just excited about the Word of God? Man, I'm, I'm so excited about this that I've been wanting to preach this for so long, and it's just and God gave me the okay, and I said, yes, here we go. But we're going to read uh, the first... Uh, Matthew 12, 38 and 40, 38 through 40. It says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seek for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now I want to give you a little background of what's going on in the scripture right here. The, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the, the people, the leaders of the church were in disbelief and they were just in a ray of what Jesus Christ was doing. It, it, it came about from, from Jesus' teachings. You know, you see, Jesus was fulfilling scripture. He was fulfilling prophecy. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had a lack of faith and, and they wanted to see something or, 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 or have something that they can touch. They wanted something that matched what they imagined. How many of us do that still today? I know I do. I look at something and I have a picture in my mind. Okay, this is how this is going to go. I'm gonna go this way, I'm gonna do this. And, and, and then when it's not that way, this ain't how I picture this. This isn't what, the way I wanted this. No, God, you can't, this can't be right. This can't be right. You, I know you don't want me going there. I need a sign. I need a sign. Now, don't get me wrong. It's okay to ask for confirmation. But when it comes, it's time to step out in faith. You can't keep asking over and over and over and over again. You see, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they wanted a sign from Jesus to prove that he was who he said he was. To prove it. And how many do the, we do this, this, every one of us in this church probably do the same thing. We know God is all powerful. I know God can heal my leg. I know he can do this, but Lord, I just, I, I need to know. I, I need confirmation. I, I need you to comfort me a little bit. You see, we've been praying for the, the answer and then it comes, but yet we still need a sign to prove it. Well, is, that, is it just me or is that God? We've been seeking God for his will and then he reveals his will to us and, and it's like, ah, we begin to doubt and that's what the devil does. He places that seed of doubt in your mind to where you'll lose faith in God. You see, God hears your prayers and he answers your prayers. He answers your prayers. It may not be the way you want them to be or it may not be the answer you want, but he answers your prayers. He is always looking out for you. He always has, has he's always looking for you at your best. He, God wants to see you succeed in every aspect of life. He wants to see you push forward in your life. It's time that we, as a church, it's time that we as Christians stop asking for God to prove himself.
time and time again. You see, I've seen God move in my life. I've seen God, Angie brought the picture of a little baby and we're gonna pray for her after church, but Rosalie, and we've prayed for her before. She's got, she's got leukemia and, and you know, the doctors said that you know, it could be spreading and, and you know, I didn't, I, I probably, you probably thought that I was laughing but I find it amusing because my God, even in that situation, he's got it. So I don't need to worry about anything else. I've seen God move. I've seen addicts sober up on the spot. I've seen that. So, so for me to walk out and say, well, God, I just, you know, I need you to prove yourself to me again. No, we're cheapening our walk. You see, we've heard testimonies of his power. We, we've experienced the goodness of his love. It's time to go. It's time to do. It's time to step out now. It's time to step out now. Not sit in our, in our pews and not sit in our offices or wherever we may be. It's time to step out and go step into what God has for us. That's what it's time for. As I was researching, there's a few specific times that the Pharisees and Sadducees saw Christ's miraculous work. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter four. And we're gonna read verses 33 and 37. It says, and in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in, their midst, down in their midst, he came out of him having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word for with, the, for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And reports about Jesus went out to the surrounding region. Look in Luke 6, and 6 verses 11, it says, On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so they might find reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there, and Jesus said to him, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life, or to destroy it. And after looking around at them, all he said to them was stretch out your hand. And he did so and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. The church folk was filled with fury. The church folks was having a hard time. Look in Luke 13, verses 10 and 13, it says, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself, and when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. Every single one of these miracles every single one of these miracles and, and every, the, the power that was manifested in these scriptures, guess who was present? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. They saw his work firsthand. They saw it. It's just like I saw Eric playing the piano. I saw it. I know he could play the piano. I see it. He's actually pretty good. I see it. They saw Jesus perform miracles. They experienced the power firsthand. Church leaders, they were witnesses to what, well, like what Pastor Richie said, they were witnesses to transformed lives. Yet they still demanded proof. They still demanded proof. They still wanted Jesus to prove himself. How many of us are the same way today? See, we're all hopefully Christians in the house. That's what I'm talking about. How many of us have seen miracles in our own lives? I want to take a little poll here. How many here has 
ask Jesus to come into their life and be their Lord and Savior. Raise your hand. There's your miracle. <coughs> because I know I didn't deserve it. I know I didn't deserve it. I know I didn't deserve it. And I know some of you, and you probably didn't deserve it either. That's a miracle. We've seen his power. We've seen his power. We, 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 we hear the testimonies that others give. We've even sat in on sermon after sermon of preaching about faith and about faith and, and yet we still say, well, Jesus, I, I, need, I don't know. I still need to see something from you. I need to see a sign you're still here and you haven't forgot about me. I need to see a sign that you care. I need to see a sign that you're gonna provide for these bills that are stacking up one after the other. I need to see a sign that you're gonna heal I need to see a sign that you're gonna love me. I need to see a sign showing me which way you want me to go. I know you've called me, but Lord, I need to see a sign. I need to see a sign whether or not I should get involved in the local church and get involved in ministry. I need to see a sign to, for, to show me that I'm right when I have this against my brother and my sister. No, you don't need a sign. You need faith. You need faith. Jesus answers this question. After the, after the church leaders have seen time and time again of his, of his power and they were still asking for the same thing Jesus answers them in verse 39 and he says and an evil and adulterous generation seek for a sign if after all that Jesus has showed you and you're still asking for a sign I'm sorry to say tonight and it's going to sound mean and rough but that's what it is you're just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees your people in the church that have heard of his power, that have probably seen his power, and, 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 but yet you're still selfish, faithless, conceited, and insincere, just like they were. Just like they were. I always say, I'm so thankful that God loved me enough that he saved me. It's the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. It really is. Because you see, in my life, I, I was living in darkness. I was living in despair. I was living in confusion. And then when I came to Christ, which all I had to do was, Lord, I need your forgiveness. How hard is that? Cleaned up. Still messed up, but I was cleaned up. See, as Christians, we need to open our, our hearts, our mind, and our eyes to, to what God has done in our life, but not just that, to what he's going to do. You see, he's not done with us. We haven't arrived. And, and like Pastor Richie said, I always say it south, if, if, if you've arrived or you've got all the answers, come see me afterwards. We'll write a book and make a million dollars. We'll be rich. None of us have arrived. And that's why we need to open our eyes to what God is doing in our lives. You see, I don't know. I've been dealing with this, but I know that somehow, some way, God is still working. I don't know how, but I know he's still working. I know he's still, still fixing. And, and if it's will, his will, I know tomorrow when I go for that MRI, it's gonna come back negative and I'm good to go. I know that because I've seen it time and time and time and time again. I've seen it but we're our own worst enemies. We are our own worst enemies when it comes to seeing what God wants for us. Us, not anybody else, us. We place limitations and we box God in. Lord, I, I, I need you to work this way. All right, God, this is, this is what I have. I need you to show up here at this place, this specific place, I need you to show up at this time because the Yankees come on at seven o'clock tonight and I need, while you're at it, I need the Yankees to win at least one game soon. But I need you to do this. And all we're doing is we're putting a box on God. I need you to do this. Oh, here's a parameter. Oh, oh, by the way, God, you need to show up here. Oh, here's another parameter. And before you know it, it's a six by six cell that you've placed God in. And God is almighty. God is all powerful. God is all knowing. So what you think may be best, 
I, I hate to break it to you, it may not be best. God's way is always better. Not maybe better, it's always better. We have to be the ones that adapt and we have to be the ones that, 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 that mold and shape ourselves into. We have our own perception of God and when, he, and when he doesn't work the way we expect him to, it brings us back to the point to where, well, God, I just, I, you know what? I need a sign to show that, that you still care. Our vision is skewed. It's skewed. Instead of asking for a sign, we need to be asking God to grow our faith. Verse 40, it says, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That was Jesus' response to asking for a sign. Jesus speaks to his resurrection. I love Resurrection Sunday. I love it. You know, we, we as Christians, we celebrate the Resurrection Sunday and we, we know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We know that he rose again on the third day, but what I don't think we remember is that in Christ's resurrection, the work's complete. It's done, it's finished. Salvation is provided. Restoration is available. Healing is delivered. God's power was manifested on the day of resurrection. We don't have to worry about anything anymore. So if we rejoice in his resurrection, why are we still asking for signs? Knowing that Christ has defeated the grave, knowing that Christ has defeated Satan, knowing that Christ has made a way, why do we still cheapen our faith? What we need is to grow our faith, increase our perception, and, 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 and step out in obedience. And when it comes to faith, it's one aspect of our Christian walk that I think we, we all could use the most improvement in. Amen? It's okay to admit that. I'll, I'll admit that. I know, I, I know my faith needs to grow daily. But I want you to listen to something. Luke 17, 5. Listen to what it says. It said, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The statement was coming from men who walked with him daily. They saw his power manifested daily. They heard his teachings daily. So let's not kid ourselves and, and say that, all, that, that, that we don't need to grow in faith. If the apostles themselves asked, was asking Christ to increase our faith, every single one of us in here needs to be praying that prayer. Far too often we have the faith that it kind of goes like this. Well, God, I'll do this, but I need you to do this. That's not faith. That's a demand. God, I, I, I know this is where you want me at, but, but you know what? I, I need some proof and I need some comfort. I, I need you to show me something that, that way I'm not messing up or I'm not out of line or, or God just show me that you're still here you see we can't live that way our faith is what pleases God our faith is what opens up the blessings of heaven we want to say man I want, I want the floodgates of heaven to open up start stepping out in faith start living in faith I, I, I promise you and, and this is just my, my personal thing if you step out in faith God will be, meet you right there. And then when you take another step, he'll meet you right there. But we have to take the initial step. Our faith is what moves the needles when it comes to the signs and wonders and the miracles. Our faith. Do we still believe? See, when it comes to having faith, I, I like to take the Bible at face value. I like to take it at face value. Matthew 17, 20, it says, He said to them, Because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Luke 17, 6, it basically says the same thing. It says, And the Lord said, If, if you had the faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Man, if the church of America today 
could have faith like this, watch out. A mighty awakening would sweep across this land because God would honor the faith of the saints. But it starts here. Increase my faith. Increase my faith. You see, that's the power we possess when we live by faith. And, and with, that, with that kind of power, why do we still ask God for signs? See, I'm not telling you anything different tonight that you don't already know. I'm just trying to reiterate it because I'm ready to see the Church of America step out in faith. It's time that we start taking the ground back that has been stolen. It's time that we stand firm on the word of God and we dig in, we get in fighting position and we say, let's go. I will not be moved. It's time the church steps into its calling that God has given us and that's to serve others, love the unlovable, help the unhelpable, that's what we need to be doing. And we can step out boldly knowing that when we take that step of faith, God is going to be right there with us. It's time to stop floundering in our Christian walk and step out in faith. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 5, it says, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our focus should be in the power that God possesses. You see, I have zero power. It is proven because as the days go older and my son continues to remind me, Dad, you have more gray hair. Dad, you're losing strength. Dad, your knee, ha, ha, ha. Dad, this, that, that. I, I, I'm breaking down. I have zero power. Now, in his eyes, though, I have, a, I have all the power. But I have zero power. I have zero control. But you know what? I have surrendered to the one that has all the power and that has all the control. So my future, I don't have to worry about. What happens tomorrow, it doesn't even concern me because I know God is going to move and work on my behalf. So when, that's why when I hear, hear people like you that comes up and says, I need you to pray, I need you, you know, this is happening, this sickness. Hey, hey let's go. That's good. That's, don't, don't, don't you worry about it. My God is bigger than that. My God can, can do mighty, mighty, mighty things, but it's easy to get caught up in human emotions when we face circumstances. It's easy. And it's okay, we, 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 we go through the emotions. That's, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you not to, but don't let the circumstance define who you are. You see, I appreciate doctors, I appreciate psychiatrists, I appreciate bankers, accountants, I appreciate the, the, the training and the, and the education that they've all had, but my God is bigger than any diagnosis, my God is greater than any emotional problem, my God will supply all my needs, my God will provide every single resource that's needed so he can get the glory, that is why our faith should solely be in God and nothing else. I can do nothing in this world without God. He possesses all the power and all the knowledge. That's why he is worthy of all the praise and all the honor. Not me, it's him. It all belongs to him. When you look at our perception, how do we view God? How do we view Christianity? I'm reading a book right now. It's called Delighting in God. And it says, you cannot say you believe in God and then exhibit behaviors that are in conflict with the holy character and nature of God. Basically saying you can't say one thing and then live another. You can't do it. You can't do it. There's no great, well, Pastor, you know, this is okay. Pastor, yeah, this is all right. I, this is nothing. This is nothing. Everybody's doing this. No. If it's not honoring God, you might want to check yourself. Amen. If it's not honoring God, you might want to check yourself. Daily, I go through a checklist in my life. Daily. If you've been to South, you, you, I've preached this thousands of times. Stand in front of a mirror. And look at yourself the way God would look at you. 
<laughs> scares me just to even think about it. Because I know that even where I'm at right now, I'm nowhere close to where God wants me to be. So daily, daily, I have to surrender to him. Daily, if I'm saying one thing, I better be living it because there's too many people watching. And I don't want one person to miss out on eternal life because I missed it for 10 minutes. I don't want that on my shoulders. I don't want that on my shoulders. We cannot view God in, in the manner that, that what, to where it would be disrespectful and we can't view our Christian walk in, in that way to, to, where, to where it would look so cheaply. That's why that is one of my pet peeves in a church is to see people saying, oh, pastor, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, and then you see them and they're the exact opposite in the world. I'm just gonna be honest with you tonight, folks. Because I lived that way for a while. And God will get your attention quickly. If you say you're a Christian, you better abide by the word of God. You better walk according to the word of God. You better worship the only one true God. You cannot worship anything else in this world. You can't put anything ahead of God because the second you, you elevate something else, it becomes an idol. And watch out. Watch out. See, our perception of God. God is a big God. God is a good God. God is an amazing God. I just listed a few. Here's, here's some attributes of what my God means to me. My God is relational. My God's righteous. My God's merciful. My God's everlasting. My God is loving. He's almighty. He's faithful. He's innovative. He's sovereign. He's unchangeable. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. That is what my God, I could, I could have went on, I could have just made a whole sermon just attributes of God and went on and on and on for about 30 minutes and I, I, I could probably still be writing. That's just what he means to me. That's what he means to me. So, so when we say we're a Christian and we accept all these things to be true, I know all these to be true. And if we believe they're true, why do we limit God? Why are we just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Well, God, I, I, that's not the way I pictured it, so I need a sign from you. No. My view of God is, is I, I, I tried to write it down one time of what God means to me, and, and I couldn't even get one word on the paper. You can't even fathom his power and the knowledge that he has. See, our unbelief and selfishness keeps us from seeing the power of God manifested in, in, in our lives and through our lives. Our limited perception, it hinders God. You know, we say God can heal, but then we doubt. I, I'm just gonna preach to me right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna confess some things now. I prayed and I said, I don't know how that's going to happen. I said, God can restore. But then you look and it's like, man, them people jacked up. I don't know about all that. God can save. Hmm. God, I know you can save me. But can you save my brother? Can you save my brother? I'm one thing, but man, he's, 
He's a whole nother cookie to deal with right there. He's a handful. All you're doing is doubting God. That's all you're doing. And the doubt occurs because our perception is skewed and blurry. You see, it's time as Christians to open our eyes and see God for who he really is and understand the power that he has is still real today. It's still relevant today. We, we always look at the Bible and you know you can read Acts and you can see all these great wonders and these great works and, and you, can read, you can read the epistles and, and every work that Paul wrote and you, man, Paul went through it and you can see how he used Paul and how he did all this. And you know what? God is still the same thing today. The same, he's the same God today. It's just we have a lack of faith and our perception is blurry. When it comes to obedience, talk about in Jeremiah 7, 23, it says, but this command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people. And walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you. You see, when your faith is there, when you got your faith to a point and then your perception is at that point and everything's beginning to line up, it's time to step out and it's time to go. Far too many Christians miss their calling because they're sitting on the sidelines or they're sitting in the pew. Their faith is, 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 is at a position to where God wants them. Their, their perception is at a position where God wants them. And then God says, okay, this is what I want you to do. And, and five years later, guess what? They're still sitting in the same pew wondering, God, when, when are you going to use me? God, you got to give me something that I know. And God's saying, no, I've already given it to you. It's time to step out before you lose it. It's time to go. It's time to do. You know, I had a friend all the time that used to say, well, let's just pray about things. Don't get me wrong. I love to pray. Like, like Pastor Rittman, prayer closet. Whew, it's awesome. But he would always say, well, let's just pray about it. Let's just pray about it. Let's just pray about it. And I looked at him one day, and this may shock you, but I said, no, let's not pray about it. Let's go do it. Let's go do it. That's what God's wanting us to do. So let's go do it. We prayed about it for three months. I'm tired of praying. I want to go do. And when you take that step of faith, guess what? Oh. Amazing. And I looked at him. I said, here's the deal. You pray and I'll do. But there has to be a, a mixture. Because you've got to be able to hear God's voice. You've got to be able to hear God's voice. You've got, you got to know that soft whisper and all the chaos. Obedience ensures us of receiving God's blessings. I can just go on my life alone. When me and Beth decided to move to New York, it was, <laughs> to look at it, it was crazy. But I'm telling you what, Ever since, I think it was two weeks before Thanksgiving, a long time ago, that we knew and we've been trying to live in obedience, I have been blessed above and beyond what I could even deserve. Above and beyond. Our obedience ensures that we're going to be in God's will instead of ours. Ooh. But, but you know, I, I had this plan. I, want, I had it mapped out. I had two promotions coming to me at Toyota. I was going to be a high boss. <laughs> I was going to have all the money I could dream of, especially in Kentucky. I had it all mapped out. I was, I was about ready to ask my wife for a truck. I'm always asking for a truck. I'm sorry. I love trucks. I'm always asking for them. I had it all mapped out. But when you obey, obey you step out of your will. And you say, God, it's yours. I, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Our obedience ensures us of, of seeing God move. I'm trying to teach Cameron this. Cameron goes to a public school, and, and I would fair to say he's probably the only Christian kid in his classroom. 
And I'm trying to tell them, I said, Cameron, your actions affect every single person around you. I said, I know you believe in God. I know you've asked God into your life. So, so God, th this is your mission field right here. I said, it's time for you to, to live the way God wants you to live. You know, look, I, I get it. We make mistakes. This, that, and that. I got you. But you have to be the light. You have to be the light. I said, I'm your father. I love you. I will always be there for you. But I cannot walk your life as much as I want to. I can't walk your life. I said, I don't know what you do at school. I don't know. That's between you and God. And you see, and it's so funny, you hear him coming back and he's sitting there and he's talking about these kids and their language and how they talk to their moms and this, that, and the other, and blah, 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 blah. And then he'll say, but when they're around me, they don't do that. Because they know I won't put up with it. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Even on the football field. He plays football, and, and I love, man, he, he's getting bad at the football field. He's popping some people at the football field. I'm so proud. I said, Cameron, I said, you have favor. I said, your coaches, they love you. They love your work ethic. They've made you a captain. I said, you got to be a leader. You got to lead from the front. You got you to be the example on the field. And we see that because you see the players. They don't mess around when Cameron's around, they don't do it. They're listening to the coach, they're watching. And it's because he's obeying me. He better obey me. I'll, I'll rock his world. <laughs> but more importantly than that, even at 10 years old, he's stepping into what God has for him and what God's doing in his life. So if God can do it for a 10-year-old, he sure can do it for a 40-year-old. He most definitely can do it for an 80-year-old. It don't matter. But we have to step out in obedience. You see, our, our obedience, and this is something that, 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 that is near and dear to me, our obedience might lead to others' breakthrough. I had a guy that chased me nonstop when I was living in sin. I don't know why he did it, but boy, I remember him to this day. I remember him coming into the pool halls and the bars and everywhere else that I was at, and, and I'm like, man, you're a Christian. You ain't supposed to be here. God wants me here with you. No, man, you can leave at any minute. You're killing a brother, <laughs> you know. But he was there, and I remember that. And you know what? I can remember the day. I, every time, every time, I always see his face. It's because he was obedient. Obedient. Our obedience could be the catalyst for your walk going to the next level. Our obedience could be the spark that ignites a revival across Staten Island. Our obedience could, and now get this, here we go, you ready? Our obedience is a level of worship unto God. No, pastor, worship, singing, this, that, no, 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 no. Obeying God is worship. It's saying, Lord, more of you and less of me. To, if you'll please stand with me tonight. If the altar workers want to come forward and, and we're not going to tarry long, but tonight you may be at that point and you may be saying, well, God, I need a sign. I need something from you. And you know what? It's okay to ask once. But the more you ask the more you're cheapening your walk with Christ because you're not believing in Him. I've done it. I've asked God for a sign. I asked God for confirmation when I moved here. And you know what? He gave me six confirmations in four different states using the same sermon. I got to a point where I was just like, okay, God, you're showing off now. I get it. But it's time to stop. ICC, it's time to step out in faith. 
It's time to step out and obey. It's time to do that.